noted astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson is on a mission now to make America smarter. And he's hoping to do that with his new tome, Welcome to the Universe, an Astrophysical Tour. Written with two of his colleagues, the book examines asteroids, aliens, and whether we may soon see humans perhaps not Neil, on Mars. And Dr. Tyson is good enough to join us uh, here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would say it's the ultimate glass half full, glass half empty discussion. So uh, let's start with the glass perhaps half full. Mm -hmm. And the search. Oh, by uh, the way, I, I, there's an actual unambiguous way to think about half full, half empty. OK. OK. A glass is half full if it reaches the halfway point while you are filling it. Fair. And it's Actually, half empty if it's it, there on its way down. Also fair. So now, yeah. while I can, while I ruminate on that, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the search for intelligent life. That, that's how I think about half full, half empty. First of all, very simply, because I know in the book, I mean, there is math in this book, and thankfully oh, so. Yeah, well, yeah. It's it's um, you know, so many books are a mile wide and then an inch deep, and I thought it was time to. Keep, give you the mile wide, but then go a mile deep. And so it's not only what we know about the universe, but how we figured it out. Okay, so so uh, first, so then I guess the even, an even simpler point, perhaps not so simple. When you talk about the universe, what, I what exactly are you talking about? Everything. Everything. <laughs> I mean, because, I, I, you know, Everything. as you point out, the space-time continuum. Yes. Everything. Bends. It, yeah, the, by the action of matter, mass and energy, uh, you can distort the fabric of space-time in the vicinity. And so that's why black holes are such disturbances in our universe. So are uh, massive galaxy clusters that turn pathways of light into funhouse mirrors where they it distorts and bends and flips. So yeah, space-time space, space -time is curved. But it also exp it, it exp and we're expanding, okay? And the universe may be vastly larger than what we can see. We only ever talk about the observable universe, and that's um, it goes out 14 billion light years. So the farthest object we can see, its light has been traveling for 14 billion years. When the universe hits 15 billion years, yeah. we'll be able to see a bigger volume of the universe because the light from something 15 billion light years away can now reach us. Which makes the search for intelligent life, or perhaps its search for us. Possibly. Ever exponentially more Yes, it's a, it's a difficult. Well, it's uh, no, but this this growing volume will wash over more and more galaxies, so that the number of galaxies that participate in our observable universe will grow up. Okay, will, will go up with time. Okay, so and I know there's a there's a, there's an equation essentially that explains uh, intelligent life and gives us a roundabout figure. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an important of what we're talking about here. A, equation is a slight overstatement. It's a way to estimate the the number of civilizations out there with whom we can have a conversation of any kind to con make contact with. So uh, it's called the Drake Equation and named after Frank Drake, a, a, a well-known uh, astrophysicist of recent decades. I, he started back in the 50s and 60s. So here's how it works. Uh, you start, I'll give a simplified version, okay. but it's the, the essence of it. You start out with the number of stars in the galaxy, several hundred billion, it's a big number, and you ask, what fraction of those have planets? What fraction of those with planets have life? What fraction of those with planets that have life have intelligent life? What fraction of those that have planets that have life that have intelligent life have civilization? Okay, C cavemen were intelligent. They were the same humans as we are. They didn't have civilization. They didn't have technology to send signals. So that's the thing you're interested Which in. Which is the measurable for intelligence the, as in it pertains to life. In this exercise, that's correct. So it's not so much how well you'll do on a, an intelligence test. Maybe the aliens we encounter are so far beyond us, we would, to them, be what worms are to us. Mm -hmm. And that would be embarrassing, I would think. That would be a blow to our <laughs> ego, because we write our own intelligence tests, and then we take them relative to other animals, and we say, we are intelligent and they are not. Um, it's funny, Carl Sagan once made the observation that while some dolphins have been able to make symbols and gestures of human communication, um, there's yet to be evidence of any human who could speak dolphin. <laughs> Fair. Very, very good. <laughs> Carl noting yes, uh, yes, yes. The, the painfully obvious, I suppose. <laughs> uh, is it inevitable then that we will come in contact, do you think, 
with said life? Well, right now we are on the passive side of this. So we're, we're observing the universe with our radio telescopes to see if a signal is going to come our way. That's kind of passive. We're not actively, well, we kind of are because our, our TV signals that are broadcast actually escape Earth's atmosphere. And so there's something what we call the radio bubble, which is the distance that our radio signals, TV signals as well, we collectively have reached in space moving at the speed of light. Radio waves also move at the speed of light. And so that's about 70 or 80 light years away. And so you can ask how many exoplanets, planets discovered in orbit around other, in orbit around other stars, uh, are in this volume. And if there were intelligent life in this volume, receiving their, those signals, their first knowledge of us as a civilization would be the earliest broadcasts, you know, um, howdy doody, yeah. you know, or on television, you'd <laughs> Uncle have, <Milty. laughs> you'd have um, I Love Lucy, yeah. uh, The Honeymooners, yeah. this sort of thing. And it's, it's, it's intriguing because they would then learn uh, how men and women interact with one another from those films. I, I mean, from those, and I'm thinking the honeymooners, you know, there's something everyone laughed at at the day, and yeah. today, you look at it and say, what, what? Um, wow. we, we said, bang, zoom to the moon, Alice. It's like, he's threatening violence. Well, <laughs> and, you know, Falcon, he, would, he would wind, he would wind <laughs> up his hand. Bang, zoom to the moon, Alice, and everyone would laugh at yeah. that. And it, so that's how alien, that's what aliens would think how we behave. All right, but then Falcon Crest is coming, so then that's gonna, <laughs> that'll, that'll solve it all. Okay. Time um, that out. Yeah. And so, but I, I, I would seem even if there are roughly a hundred civilizations oh, yeah. out there. So in in Welcome to the Universe, we give the very latest calculation for that, and uh, based on the very latest estimates and on another concept called the Copernican principle, put forth by uh, Rich Gott, one of the co-authors with me on this. There's also Michael Strauss, uh, two um, astrophysicists who we co taught a course at Princeton. Uh, back, uh, which is the foundation for this for this book. But so uh, you, you run the math and you run the calculations. The latest estimate is about a hundred civilizations in the galaxy that we can communicate with today. Okay, we all then share a common fear: asteroid strikes on our various planets, our various exoplanets. Uh, you also believe that that is an inevitability here. Do you believe oh, that? Not, no, there's not my belief. There's no, be, there's no beliefs here. It's, it's, it, is there data? Is there no happened. data? That's okay. It's happened. We have been hit before. Yeah. We will get hit again. That's not a belief system. That, that's, that's Mass extinction that's ma events? The mathematics strike? of the gravity uh, in, in this solar system? Yeah. I think, think of it as a kind of a cosmic ballet choreographed by the forces of gravity. Okay. And in that ballet, things run into each other. <laughs> That's part of the choreography of it. So, so yeah, and uh, we were hit 65 million years ago. The dinosaurs were not prepared for this. Yep. They didn't have a space program. They didn't even have opposable thumbs. Had they, I'm betting they would have tried to not go extinct. Okay, so then uh, short of sending Bruce Willis back up there, uh, or Ben Affleck, Very who short survived of it, yes. okay. uh, what can, what more can we do? Yeah, well, with the space program and enlightened governance, you can say, all right, I want to protect the world. I don't want to go extinct. So you can say, well, let's make it two planet species, but that still renders half your species extinct uh, or, or kills half your species. So many people say that, including Hawk, Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk. Let's be multi planet. In case something really bad happens here, humans still survive. And I'm not, I'm fine. Okay, however, I'd rather just figure out how to solve that problem in the first place. Yeah. If you have enough technology and space program moxie to colonize another planet, then you could just deflect the asteroid. Do you feel like we have the enlightened governance to make this happen? No, but it's not, it's not locally, it's, it's, it's internationally. Is, are, because suppose an asteroid's gonna come and you project the trajectory and it goes to the Indian Ocean. Or we just say, not my problem. We're in America. We say, no, you don't do that. This is we we well we presume we care for everyone. Uh, uh, Trump says 
America first, but I'm an astrophysicist, so I think of Earth first. Yeah. So, sorry. Uh, so I think for, of Earth first and all of humanity first. So what you might do, there might be other ideas here, you make a pot of money that everyone contributes to as some fraction of their GDP. That's how you pay into the UN, for example. That pot of money goes to whoever has the best space program at the time we discover an asteroid that will hit anywhere on Earth. And that funds, and whoever else participates their technology, their pieces. The space station had an, a robotic arm made in Canada. All right? If, you, if your country does it best, you put that in there, put it all together, and they'll all save the Earth as one. So, 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 yeah, you deflect it. And colonize Mars because it's a fun thing to do, not because you're doing it just so that half of you don't die while the rest Although, do. Although, I'm with you about Mars. Colonize Mars because other people think that's a fun thing to do. And when you work out all the kinks, Neil and I are coming. Oh, yes, it's like, right. We're not. Yeah, yeah in, the, in here, I just talk <laughs> about, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, who do, nobody doesn't want to visit Mars, but it, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who's going to do that first. first. Let, and, and whoever built the spaceship, <laughs> whoever built, let, let that person send their mother right, right first. Yep. <laughs> right. Okay. After the mom goes and comes back safe, yeah. I'll sign me up. I'm okay with being fifth. <laughs> I, I still think it would be. But, I'm, but pretty, that being said, uh, I'm glad we, we are a species where some of those who walk among us willingly go to the front of that line. Amen. Without them, no one would have left the cave. It would have been, oh my gosh, there's a, there's a valley there. I know right. who's, I'll be fifth, but if everyone wants to be fifth, then no one goes first. It's a natural segue, though. Without you and your colleagues, uh, first of all, we would not have a book with which we could do curls. Oh, yeah, so, you learn, no, so there's a whole section on gravity in there, yeah. and you learn about gravity by carrying it around. That's it's very a true. heavy book. It's yeah. a heavy book, but uh -huh. uh, it's. Uh, there's a lot in here. If you haven't noticed, I blew through every time constraint imaginable and barely scratched said service. Dr. Tyson, thank you so very thank, much. Thanks for having All me. Right. All right. Let's make this the first part of a multi-part series. <laughs> I was, I was simply attempting to bend the time-space continuum with that visit. Thank you, Doctor.